from the Mercy One Studio. Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imogene Ingredients. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. It's time to hear from the top Christian litigators in the nation who have come forward to tell us the truth and help us defend our faith. Hear ye, hear ye. All rise. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Menno is in session. And good Thursday morning. I'm Deacon Mike Mano at an undisclosed location. Gina is anchoring things in the studio. And as I speak, Amy Coney Barrett is one step closer to the Supreme Court as the Senate Judiciary Committee has just reported her nomination to the full Senate, which where she is expected to be confirmed on Monday. Gina, how are you this morning? Good morning, Deacon Mike. I'm doing well. We missing you here in the studio. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm at an undisclosed location. I uh, have uh, coming to me a suitcase full of cash from the Chinese communist government I'm supposed to hold for a guy named Hunter. So <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. Deacon Mike, you, uh, you need to be careful with what you're talking about. <laughs> I th- yeah, <laughs> they're going to throw rocks through my window. I'm just glad you have internet wherever you're at. Yeah. <laughs> it's good for you to join us today. Did you hear the, uh, the um, uh, Judiciary Committee this morning as they uh, reported out uh, Amy Coney Barrett? No, I heard it was planned, and I'm so glad that the vote took place. Uh, was, it was, was uh, the 12 room... to nothing. Okay, were the nothings no present, Democrats or did showed. they actually, they were, there were no Democrats in the room? Is no right? Democrats in the room. That's what was reported, that they weren't going to yeah. show. Well, that's too bad. It's an opportunity to, uh, Amy Coney Barrett is going to be a fabulous Supreme Court justice. I did. Watch... And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, too, with uh, Brianna Bird. Uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, her nomination and going to talk to us about possible court packing, too. So, well, that'd be interesting. interesting day. And yeah. I think um, our, vice, uh, our former vice president, president, current presidential candidate, has now given some kind of a response to that question. So we'll be anxious to get Brenna's uh, opinion about the, his response. Yeah, I think some kind of are the operative words there. Right, right. Well, um, we also, I was able to watch one of the two films that we're going to discuss today with the producers. Have you watched both of them? I saw both of them, and they are excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, About a year ago. Jump out of your chair, excellent. The first movie came out last year, uh, Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, um, premiered on EWTN, available on DVD, um, and it discussed the rise of socialism in America. Right. And I thought it was really well done. I watched it two more times in the, because it's available free on EWTN's website. I've watched it twice now. And it's so scary how predictable some of those movements were in the 60s and 70s to producing what we have today in our political realm. Absolutely. But and I do and love the key they... thing is there, these were done in little tiny steps. And now we see what's happening is a broad sweep um so we can recognize a little bit better what's going on rather than kind of the hidden agenda that was before us before as documentaries go they're very well done and and leave us with a little bit of hope so we can talk about Mm -hmm. that with our the producers yeah and the other one had to do with uh, attack on marriage and the family uh the um, uh, gender agenda and uh it um it it took apart uh, transgenderism and all these other things that are going on right now. So uh, we'll have a talk uh, with uh, Richard and Stephen, uh, the uh, producers of the programs, uh, in a little bit, the end of, uh, after we get done with uh, uh, Brenda. I kn- and uh, a- a- that'll be toward the bottom of the hour. I know that, notice that Richard and Stephen, the producers, have the same last name, Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. Yes. Mm-hmm. Are they related? Father and son. How neat. That's a wonderful, mm-hmm. father wonderful and legacy. Son. Don't want to compare them to Joe and Hunter, but uh, <laughs> father and son. Okay. Deacon Mike. Uh, 
would you, you like gotta to have some laugh at some of the stuff that's going on because if you take it so seriously you'll go crazy well very true very yeah, true yeah yeah I have a prayer to begin if you'd like me to Go ahead. insert yes. that now. We'd like that. Peace would be important. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women, and peace among the nations of the earth. Turn to your way of love, those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Strengthen us in hope, and give us the wisdom and courage to work tirelessly for a world where true peace and love reign among the nations and in the hearts of all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gina. And uh, you're listening to Faith on Trial on Catholic Radio. And we will be back in a few minutes with Brenna Bird from uh, Guthrie County. Hi, this is Father John Ricardo, and I want to thank Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory for underwriting Christ is the Answer. Losing a loved one, as we know, is never easy, and it can leave you feeling lost and even hopeless at times. But Caldwell Parish helps ease that burden by sincerely caring both about your loss and about your faith. Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory is Des Moines' only Catholic-owned and operated funeral home. The number is 515-276-0551 or online at caldwellparish.com. Thank you, Blessed International, for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Everyone lives their life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. How we use that time directly affects if our life will leave a significant impact or not. Each year, Blessed International leads Central Iowans on a 12-day, all-inclusive experience sharing the heart of Christ with children in South Africa. Teams are forming to do something significant in an African child's life. Learn more at BlessedManInternational.org. That's BlessedManInternational.org. Is it time for a new roof? Then it could be time for you to get to know Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company entering its 30th year of business. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs, and have the experience to meet all of your roofing needs with personal service. With Bell Construction, the owner will come to your home or place of business in person to inspect and ensure the quality of work that you deserve. They pride themselves in working with you on a personal basis and making sure you are satisfied. Bell Construction, 515-963-4494. Thank you, Big Red Q Quick Print, for underwriting the Sports Report. Family owned and operated since 1980, Big Red Q Quick Print is a full service print shop ready to help you with all your printing needs with speed and accuracy. Forms, manuals, brochures, letterhead, envelopes, business cards, custom invitations, design, and bindery. Big Red Q Quick Print, located across from Merle Hay Mall. Online at bigredq Des Moines.com. Big Red Q Quick Print. We make printing easy. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by the Catholic Tuition Organization. Your support of CTO provides qualifying families tuition assistance to send their kiddos to our Catholic schools. They benefit and you benefit with 65% Iowa tax credits. Online at ctoiowa.org. Until December 15th, contributions from new donors are matched. New donors double their impact with a donation to CTO. Thanks to the Reichardt Family Foundation. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Faith on Trial provided by Paul Martin and Paul Mitchell, owners of Imogene Ingredients. Imogene Ingredients supply specialized feed ingredients for livestock and pet diets to improve maternal and young animal health in both conventional and organic production. And we're back listening to Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio. Brianna Bird is the uh, Guthrie County attorney, and she was the counsel to then Governor Carrie Branstad. Brianna, how are you this morning? Oh, doing well, thank you. Good, good. Well, I'm glad you could join us here today. Well, me too. I appreciate the chance to talk with you even on this rainy day. (laughs) Yeah, rainy day. And um, if... Somebody can let the studio know that I'm getting feedback uh, in uh, in my earphones here. Uh, all right, let's talk about the um, SCOTUS nomination. Looks like uh, the uh, nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, has passed another hurdle here with the, um, uh, the Judi- Judiciary Committee uh, voting her out, I guess, 12 to nothing with all the Democrats uh, abstaining. They didn't actually abstain. They didn't even show up for the hearing, uh, boycotting, I guess. Uh, So now she is expected to be confirmed. I guess it is on Monday that they've scheduled that vote. Uh, What can you tell us about uh, what you know about uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and how will she fit into the Supreme Court? 
Well, uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett is a very well-qualified judge. Uh, she's already an appellate judge with a, a proven track record, uh, one of being a good judge who decides cases based on the law and also for her character, her temperament, her intellect. Uh, and I think all of America got a chance to see that during her confirmation hearings. Those were some tough hearings, and she did a great job Uh just uh, just fantastic. I know it was encouraging to many, uh, I'll just say women attorneys in particular, uh, to see someone like her uh, representing other women lawyers, attorneys, and judges. She did a fantastic job, and uh, she's cleared the Judiciary Committee, and Iowa has two senators on that committee who helped her get through that process, Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst. Uh, and now she's headed uh, to the floor of the Senate for her confirmation vote. And, uh, yeah, you're right. The last I heard, they're planning on doing that early next week. So once that is done, so, uh, she'll but, win. By the end of next week, we could have a new uh, Supreme Court justice. Oh, you're exactly right. It, it was a fast process, but yet they took the time to, to make sure that uh, the Senate asked the questions they had. And so it was a deliberate process, but one that moved pretty quickly. So she'll be on the court when this is said and done, I think. Well, they didn't have to wait uh, too long because uh, apparently um, Judge Barrett didn't have to put together a lot of notes for it. Well, it doesn't look like she needs notes. I think she already knows uh, her philosophy. Uh, she is very sharp. She certainly wasn't reading from any talking points. We can say that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question here, uh, and I don't know if you have too many thoughts on it or not, but it has to do with the suggestion that is coming from the left that uh, depending on how this uh, Amy Barrett thing works out, which apparently it's going to end up in confirmation and she's going to be on the court, uh, they may want to, uh, Democrats may want to add justices to the court, extra justices to the court and uh, what we would call court packing. Now, I know that term has been thrown around a bit lately, uh, but uh, that's exactly what it is because there's no definite number of justices named in the uh, Constitution. It just says a Supreme Court, and it leaves it up to Congress to make it. So what's it look like if we, uh, if we go through that, uh, and, and what do you suppose would happen with a packed court? Well, it's quite extraordinary that the answer of, uh, I would say, uh, the minority party in the Senate and the presidential candidate Biden to the fact that there's a Republican president and a Senate that will confirm Amy, Amy Coney Barrett, that the reaction is, let's pack the court. Uh, that is, uh, you know, FDR tried to do it. A successful court packing uh, would be bad for our country. It would turn the court into basically a political football that would go back and forth between the sides when a new president was elected. And, and quite frankly, where does that stop? There is no valid reason to expand the number of justices. It's just pure politics. Yeah, the uh, history of this is that uh, the Supreme Court started off with six justices. And because they didn't have an intermediate set of uh, appellate courts at the time, uh, initial appeals from the district courts in the federal district was um, uh, held it, with, with a federal a city federal judge district court judge uh, who was joined by a Supreme Court justice who would sit with them to hear those appeals and I guess there were two of the Supreme Court justices and that's how they heard initial appeals and the reason why the numbers fluctuated so much was because as the uh, uh, the, the country grew and new states were at it, uh, they needed to add extra Supreme Court justices to be able to hear these appeals. And so it actually at one time got up to 10 justices, and then it was shortly after the Civil War that uh, Congress set the number at nine, and it has been there some, since something like uh, 1869 or something like that. And uh, in 1911, I guess it was, that the Congress created this uh, independent set of uh, uh, appeals courts that we have now. And so that cut the nexus then between the Supreme Court and the, the uh, courts of appeals. Yeah, that, your history is spot on there. We've had nine justices for, what is it now, 151 years. So that's been a long time. And in our court, too, there's an interesting statistic. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court hears half as many arguments 
and decides half as many cases as it did in the 80s. So there really is no need for additional justices from a capacity perspective. It's pure politics. As a fiscal conservative, Brenda, I, 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 I know how much staff and how much real estate it would take to add five more or four more justices to the Supreme Court um, in our tax dollars. And is that really a good use of our of our resources? Well, exactly. I think you make a very good point. If they have half as much work as they did 40 years ago, why would we add to the number and increase the burden on the American taxpayer? Right. I, the, the other um, point that needs maybe to be addressed is the fact that the all of this blow up over, I mean, it's almost like it's a revenge or a vengeance tactic to suggest that we pack the court kind of lays out that the um, United States Congress, or at least part of uh, the Congress, believes that the court is, uh, is, is political and leads us as, a, as a, a constituents to understand the court more as a tool of the Congress. That is a very good and astute observation, Gina, because you're exactly right. The arguments that are being made about court packing Uh, Once we dig a little bit deeper into the motives and reasons for that, it shows us that there are those who believe that the courts are political. Clearly, our founding fathers did not think that. They wanted to insulate the courts from politics and from elections. Uh, But, you know, we can see the politics. And when we look at that, we can also see the very big differences between what I'm going to call judicial philosophy between an Amy Coney Barrett and then a liberal activist judge, justice who uh, engages in policy making rather than interpreting the law as it's written. Uh, a very big difference between the judicial philosophies between uh, judges that decide cases based on the law and those that legislate from the bench. Um, I, I also noticed that our um, presidential nominee, uh, Mr. Biden, has uh, has a 60-minute interview, this uh, program interview on Sunday. I r- saw a clip last night in the news, and it sounds like he's addressed the question from his point of view, and he has kind of kicked the ball down the road and said, Among one of the first things I'll do is um, put together a committee to take a look at the options uh, of, about the number of justices on the Supreme Court. So I, I'm wondering if his counterparts are going to think that that's adequate or if he if this is just a way for him to make the question go away. I think he's trying to make the question go away, Gina. I mean, I, I think it's very telling that he couldn't answer that question and wouldn't answer it. Someone is either for court packing or they're not. Everybody knows what court packing is. It's, it's not a tough one to answer. And uh, he did evade that question uh, and now he's talking about a committee or commission to uh, study options. I think that's another non-answer that perhaps tells us all we need to know. Uh, if he's not willing to denounce court packing, then it certainly makes me concerned that he sees the court as just a further political instrument uh, to do the will of Congress rather than to interpret the Constitution and statutes faithfully according to what they actually say. Right. Well, One of the things I think we've noticed over the past uh, year or so, especially with the coronavirus and people, uh, governors and mayors cracking down on churches, is the value of an independent judiciary to religious liberty. And, of course, this is what this program is about and what we're very concerned with. Exactly. Uh, a packed court, where would you see, uh, let's, let's say, a President Biden uh, puts on four new people to the court, Um, where's religious liberty going to go? Well, it will be a, it will deal a serious blow to religious liberty if Biden is able to pack the courts, because uh, we are seeing uh, cases coming through the courts and some changes in our society where people of faith are being attacked for their uh, sincerely held religious beliefs. And uh, when that happens, it's very important that we have judges and justices that understand the protection that the First Amendment gives to religious liberties. It gives those protections to Catholics, but also all kinds of uh, religious minorities in our country. And that really is something that uh, is unique to America and unique to our Constitution, that we protect religious liberty. And it's uh, been in our Constitution uh, since the beginning, since, since, the, since the Bill of Rights. The Founding Fathers understood how important that was, given their experience. Well, now, there's a, a couple of views of uh, 
religious liberty. Uh, one uh, is expressed in the free expression uh, clause of the Constitution. The other one is um, uh, more um, narrow than that. It believes that uh, freedom of religion is basically your right to worship as you wish, but not necessarily to act out or live out your religion. Uh, do you see that as a possible uh, point of departure with a new court? I really do, I, and I think that's an important distinction to bring up because uh, you're right. Uh, when when you have judges and justices that want to limit religious liberty um, and expand in other areas, what they end up doing is saying that, that faith is something we just do in church on Sunday for an hour. It is not something that permeates our whole life. Um, our, uh, our vocation is, as people, our families, uh, everything we do in our life. It's, I believe, personally, that it's simply not possible for someone to separate the faith part of themselves and put that off to the side and reserve that just for certain spheres. Instead, faith is meant to be lived in the public square, and that's something our Founding Fathers agreed with uh, when we read the text of the Constitution. I think that's clearly what they were addressing, not just the right to go to church on Sunday and worship as you choose, but something far more significant. I remember years ago, and, and this sticks in the back of my mind all the time when this issue comes up, uh, there was an interview uh, on one of the cable stations with one of their talking heads, and it was about a case out of California where a female doctor refused uh, for religious reasons to perform, uh, and I, for, I forget what it was, a uh, hysterectomy uh, for somebody wanting to be transgender or something like that, but uh, refused to perform a, a medical procedure that violated her conscience. She sent the um, patient to another doctor who apparently did do the procedure, uh, but then she was sued. And they had a debate on this program I was listening to, and the attorney for the woman suing the doctor was on the program, and she was asked specifically, does this doctor not have a right to her own religious freedom? And the doctor or the attorney replied, she has the right to worship how she wants to on Sunday morning in her church, but in her office she has to do what the state tells her to do. Wow, that's an extraordinary statement, uh, Deacon Mike. It really is that that um, that someone's uh, religious liberty is not being respected. I mean, that's clearly not what the Constitution says. Uh, clearly not. And you know, there are many professions and people who could interact with that same kind of conflict. So, nurses who are uh, forced to assist at an abortion, or pharmacists who have to hand over uh, an abortion-causing pill. Um, there are there are many different ways that people have a right to their conscience and a right to their faith, and and for the government to uh, tell them otherwise, uh, I think fundamentally destroys religious freedom. And, and I think Mike has really hit on a point, Brenna, um, and that's why this uh, court packing and and these, the nomination of a Amy Coney Barrett is so important, is that um, our social norms have been sliding towards that state mandated. Um, activities by the citizens, you know, whether it's mask wearing or just going to church or, you know, you need to perform all medical procedures that are allowed under, you know, the medical directives. Uh, all of these things directed by the state is a slippery slope to losing not only our, our religious liberties, but look out press because the, they're itemized in that First Amendment also. Right. And during the confirmation process, we saw the the overt and obvious hostility to her religious faith and her religious beliefs. Uh, it was there for everyone to see. It was a type of anti-religious bigotry that um, we see sometimes, but it was certainly very bold, and I think it featured more broadly in her confirmation process than in the past. And I think that's a troubling sign for our culture, but it's also a sign that people of faith really need to engage in the political process and um, make their voices heard through voting and through other means. Well, and I, our educational system. I mean, I don't think our children in the schools are clearly understanding our Constitution, our our government, um, the way it is meant to be uh, upheld, rather being taught the way they'd like, you know, like the, the left would like us to understand our form of government. 
Right. I mean, our, our principles and way of life uh, in our Constitution is only one generation away from extinction. And we really have to teach that to every generation in order to renew those principles. Otherwise, we'll lose sight of them. Right. It's something that's easy to take for granted because we just wake up every day in the United States of America. But let's make sure our children are waking up uh, in the same kind of country that we had when we were kids. And we can't rely just on the courts to, to, uh, to handle that for us, to address that. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a, our Constitution is built on the people, and so ultimately the culture and what we do, who we elect, uh, how we govern ourselves, it is up to the people. Uh, we the people. Uh, and that phrase is the very beginning of our document for a good reason. It's up to us. One of the things that has scared me a little bit, and I think says a lot about what is going on, is uh, Senator Dine Feinstein, uh, who was the one that coined the term that uh, doctrine lives loudly within you. Uh, when the current um, um, hearing for Amy Barrett was uh, finished, uh, she and, uh, and the chairman of the committee, uh, Senator Graham, uh, embraced as they left the um, committee room. Now it seems that there's an organized effort to get Diane Feinstein for being, I guess, kind to Senator Graham. You know, Deacon Mike, that is so sad, uh, that, and I have seen that as well, that they're after her because uh, she was kind after the hearing. Certainly during the hearing, she was not a supporter of Senator Graham's choice, Amy Coney Barrett, but... Uh, you know, what she did and being kind, that should be a model for how people who disagree uh, interact with one another. And so it's very sad that she's being attacked for that. Um, and I must say, I certainly defend her for uh, giving him a hug and showing him kindness. That was a, a good thing and something we should all encourage. I think so. And before we let you go, because we're running out of time here, just one other question. Um, they, uh, they're talking about the possibility of making the District of Columbia uh, uh, one of several territories, but the District of Columbia a state, thus giving it to United States senators. Um, what's the constitutionality of doing that? Well, the only way to do that, to make Washington, D.C. a state, if that were found to be a good idea, which I think there are some concerns with that, there would have to be a constitutional amendment. There's, the Constitution's clear on it. Um, I, I think that is how a state would have to be created if, if Washington, D.C. would be made into a state. But there are a lot of other practical issues, I think, that uh, would interfere with making that a reality for people who support D.C. statehood. Brown, I want to thank you for joining us today. Certainly appreciate the conversation. Uh, keep in touch. We'll probably want to have you back one of these days. Well, I'd love to. It's so nice to talk to both of you this morning. That's good to hear from you, you too. You, you passed our muster. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> thank, you for jo thank you for joining us. Uh, you're listening to Faith on Tron, Iowa Catholic Radio, and we will be back in just a couple of minutes with the producers of the Wolf and Sheep's Clothing uh, documentaries. Thank you, Blessed Mother International, for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Everyone lives their life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. How we use that time directly affects if our life will leave a significant impact or not. Each year, Blessment International leads Central Iowans on a 12-day, all-inclusive experience sharing the heart of Christ with children in South Africa. Teams are forming to do something significant in an African child's life. Learn more at blessmentinternational.org. That's blessmentinternational.org. Is it time for a new roof? Then it could be time for you to get to know Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company entering its 30th year of business. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs, and have the experience to meet all of your roofing needs with personal service. With Bell Construction, the owner will come to your home or place of business in person to inspect and ensure the quality of work that you deserve. They pride themselves in working with you on a personal basis and making sure you are satisfied. Bell Construction, 515-963-4494. Thank you, Big Red Q Quick Print, for underwriting the sports report. Family owned and operated since 1980, Big Red Q Quick Print is a full service print shop ready to help you with all your printing needs with speed and accuracy. Forms, manuals, brochures, letterhead, envelopes, business cards, custom invitations, design, and bindery. Big Red Q Quick Print, located across from Merle Hay Mall. Online at bigredq des Moines.com. Big Red Q Quick Print. We make printing easy. 
Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by the Catholic Tuition Organization. Your support of CTO provides qualifying families tuition assistance to send their kiddos to our Catholic schools. They benefit and you benefit with 65% Iowa tax credits. Online at ctoiowa.org. Until December 15th, contributions from new donors are matched. New donors double their impact with a donation to CTO. Thanks to the Reichardt Family Foundation. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Dowling Catholic Sports is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic. With two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling graduate, and Dr. Craig Harper, the Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at 60th and Ashworth in West Des Moines. 515-440-4610 or online ashworthvision.com. Here's your forecast on Iowa Catholic Radio. Windy for the afternoon will be in the mid-60s, and we have a good chance of showers and thunderstorms. More showers overnight with our low in the upper 30s, and then cloudy and cool tomorrow, 42. The weather is brought to you by Rock Valley Physical Therapy, outstanding outpatient physical therapy and sports medicine rehabilitation with seven convenient locations in the Des Moines metro and southwest Iowa area. I'm meteorologist Steve Hamilton on Iowa Catholic Radio. And you're listening to Iowa Catholic Radio. This is Faith on Trial, and we are here with Richard and Stephen Payne, who are the uh, producers of our of the uh, EWTN documentaries, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing and A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing Two. Gentlemen, how are you this morning? Very well. Trying not to speak over one another. How you doing, Mike? God bless you. <laughs> We're doing. <laughs> We're doing just fine. Um, I don't. I don't know if you were listening to the beginning of the program, but Gina and I are separated right now. I am at what I call an undisclosed secret location, and Gina <laughs> is in the um, studio. So w- we will try not to speak over each other right. too. So we're exactly. <laughs> we're on the same problem at both ends. Let's talk Very about good. these. D- <laughs> let's talk about these documentaries. Um, let's talk first a little bit about A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, which it deals with the rise of socialism. You bet. Uh, that uh, is a film that we produced in 2016, and it's on uh, Saul Alinsky, the community organizer, American community organizer and socialist, and uh, he basically reveals his uh, his socialism, his background, his history, and how he infiltrated the Catholic Church and used monies uh, within the uh, the collection basket to support organizations that were intrinsically evil. And then, well, and uh, the most re- that's four years ago now, and we were on with you. Have, have fine memories of that, and. Uh, and well, every time you do a film, a we're going to have you back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this this is um, really uh, four years ago, and uh, in the meantime, uh, this was turned into a series, and then the latest, uh, which we just released on the network, is uh, uh, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing 2, The Gender Agenda. And that was excellently done. Um, and, and I think it's, it's worth taking a little bit of time with because it's very topical right now to what's going on with, um, uh, out in, in society with transgenderism and everything. Oh, very much so. I mean, we are under attack, and, uh, and even Joe Biden himself was running for president last week. He basically came out clear and uh, unequivocally that he supports Eight-year-old children having sex change op- sex change operations. Which yeah, I fell off my chair when outrageous. I heard him say that. I was watching that uh, town hall, um, yep. and and just to set it up so that uh, our listeners know what we're talking about, uh, he was asked by one of the uh, uh, participants in the town hall about her eight-year-old daughter, uh, who was transgender. And uh, Mr. Biden made it sound like it was okay for her to make her choice that she wanted to be transgender and to start whatever hormone therapies or whatever was necessary uh, for an eight-year-old at that time to make the transition from one 
gender to another. Exactly. And in our film, we profile a gentleman who went through just that. <laughs> and, uh, yes. excuse me, and he was, uh, his name is Walt Heyer. And in the early 1940s, when he was uh, four years old, he had the tragic event. Uh, he spent a lot of time with his grandmother, who was a seamstress. And his grandmother uh, went ahead when his parents weren't around, decided that he was going to she was going to make a, a dress, a purple chiffon dress for this little four-year-old and, and had him, you know, wearing it throughout the house. And uh, it, this, this mark on his, on his, uh, in his mind and his soul stayed with him through his whole life until the early 1980s when he decided, after being married and having children, that he was going to uh, uh, receive therapy, uh, you know, Drug therapies and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, surgery to change his sex, and uh, his whole point is that the, the consequences that came out of that were just absolutely catastrophic for his life. And uh, people are so many people have uh, have gone the same route or are considering it now, and it it practically destroyed his life and the the amount of. Uh, uh, the amount of people that are uh, even have taken their own lives in suicide and mm -hmm. uh, the suicide rates are just uh, a skyrocket. They're incredible. And uh, so that's really, you know, why we made the film is we wanted to get to the root of, of where this ideology came from, uh, its history, and to be able to track it uh, by two, two particular individuals, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Alfred Kinsey, who had the biggest impact in the American, you know, uh, scene. And uh, exposing these ideologies, knowing where they came from and what they actually mean, so that people can start to realize how duped they've been. I, I think Kinsey is a name that a lot of our listeners will understand, but what about Simone? Can you give us a little brief uh, bit on her so that our listeners know? Well, Simone was is really considered the founder of the second wave of uh, radical feminism, and uh, she uh, is French-born. And uh, the early part of the twentieth uh, century, she grew up a Catholic, uh, um, but uh, had a relationship with her father, which confused her very much. He he wanted her to think and encouraged her to think as a man, and uh, uh, she um, uh, went to the Sorbonne as she got older. By then, she had uh, left her faith and uh, uh, turned really to modern uh, literary, the lit modern literary world, writing uh, fiction, and uh, she went to the Sorbonne, and there she met uh, the father of modern existentialism, Jean-Paul Sartre, who... Uh, uh, they uh, they formed a, a lifelong relationship. Uh, they lived together but never married, and uh, he was a bisexual, and so was she. And in many ways, they uh, uh, they lived out uh, a life in pursuit of of these uh, deviancies and uh, shared them and supported each other. Uh, she he was also a a, uh, a a cog very much in pedophilia, and she even procured for him. Uh, she wrote. Uh, she's known uh, for uh, her major work called uh, the Second Sex, uh, and uh, in which basically the uh, the existentialist mode uh, predominates. That you're not born a woman. She would. Uh, see herself in the position of choosing to become whatever sex she wished uh, to become. Which That's, is a that seems to be a, a uh, belief in much of the left today. Yes, exactly. Very much so. And, uh, what can, you know... Oh, go ahead. Um, go ahead, uh, Mike. Sure. Oh, I, what I was going to say is, uh, have you gotten any feedback, especially negative feedback, uh, for Wolf in Sheep's Clothing too, the gender uh, agenda, or gender well, agenda. Really, That's yeah. a tongue Nothing, twister for me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we received, there was one particular uh, 
I think, blog post uh, of somebody that was pro-LGBT that uh, I don't even think had seen the film yet. So, uh, But other than that, uh, we haven't really uh, received anything that was uh, was negative. Being re- uh, released in the Catholic network, I think our uh, viewership uh, uh, is... Uh, um, is made up of um, a more traditional Catholics uh, sure. who are finding in the film a real support for their classical moral uh, foundations, and uh, uh, we're looking have been looking for something that, although was very s- sympathetic uh, to every human being, no matter what uh, they're involved in, they. Uh, they want to see embrace the the classical tradition of uh, this uh, of homosexuality and uh, transgender as really uh, as the catechism says uh, a um, intrinsic disorder. Now the program, both uh, documentaries, were uh, on the air this past weekend. Uh, do you know when any other upcoming viewings are in case somebody missed it? Sure. This Sunday, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, it'll be on as a double feature again. So they'll be showing at 8.30 Eastern. 8.30 Eastern, they'll have A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing 1, the original film. And then at 10, at 10 o'clock Eastern, they'll have uh, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing 2 on. So a little double feature night. I have to sure Sunday really night. The, pop your the, popcorn and watch. Them. Go ahead, Gina. Yes, and I have not exactly. had an opportunity to, to see the second um, uh, production. However, I would say that I I have I delight in the way you tell a documentary story. It's almost like a mystery story with detectives that put the facts Thank all you. up on the board and connect with yarn or string the parts to putting together the whole picture for us of where we are today and how. Um, language and vocabulary have really dumbed us down to the to the truth as citizens. Yeah. Well, that you've touched on the heart of how Jesus himself uh, uh, communicated to crowds. He told stories, and uh, that's how we really try to uh, to work is to uh, tell the story truthfully, and uh, so people get inside it in a way that. Uh, isn't just uh, being caught up with a, a head trip, as they say, but uh, that touches their heart as well. Yeah, it's a bigger film too than the than the last one. So you'll see, there's a lot, even a lot more, uh, even cuts in this film than than the last one. It's uh, it's got a lot more packed into it. So uh, people will probably be faced to have to watch it several times, and and every time you'll watch it you'll get a little something new out of it too so, i wholeheartedly um, agree i've watched the first one three times now and I, it's just fascinating to me how parts of history relate to what's going on in our contemporary world and the 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 result of what happened in history and that history repeats itself and if we understood our oh, history yes. we would be so much better off but i, I do Absolutely. want you to touch yeah. a little bit about the it's it's not all doom and gloom both um from what I understand, I know definitely in the first movie and the second movie, uh, use a third of the film, uh, use a third of the documentary to talk about the hope and the things that we can do uh, as Catholics and that's Christians. That's so important. Mm-hmm. That's the, that salvific aspect is is key uh, because we're dealing with a, a form of socialism which is called critical theory, which is really the result of cultural Marxism. And it tends to criticize everything, certainly everything, and uh, as they work on uh, on uh, infiltrating um, American society and all of its institutions, they do so by criticizing our whole history. And um, uh, it's interesting that we we bring in, um, you know, uh, Our Lady of Fatima and her uh, her words to us. Uh, uh, but uh, we also bring in uh, Bishop Sheen, who, uh, uh, in one of his uh, uh, his shows, highlighted uh, the the um, that we're in a, a culture growing more negative, and 
even at his in his era, he was seeing the impact of that communism was having within uh, the American culture. You can imagine well, what he'd say today. He, he lived. He, he, he had, he had about, worked with uh, Bella Dodd in uh, reconverting her yes, back to the faith, and she was one of the communist right. leaders in the country. Yeah, that's right. And uh, what else? Catherine, uh, go ahead, Catherine de Hoek, Um Well, excuse me, Ka- uh, Catherine. Uh, um, uh, basic. Well, Stephen, why don't you take this? Okay. Well, you know, it, it's, it's you're absolutely right. I mean, Bella Dodd, and we have uh, some. We have a new uh, revelation, which is not so new. It's been around for a bit, but we did have mm. when we shot the film. It wasn't around, uh, but uh, we uh, we interviewed Alice von Hildebrand, who's a great scholar oh, yes. and and teacher. And she reveals that it wasn't just 1,100 men uh, that uh, Bella Dodd uh, brought into the priesthood that were communists. It was, they were not just communists, but they were homosexual, immoral men. And she revealed that to them, uh, to she and her husband, Dietrich, right in the seat that uh, Dad was sitting in when we did the interview for her. So, I mean, this is, uh, you realize that, you know, all of what the Church is suffering through right now we're dealing with the, uh, you know, the horrible fruits of that, uh, that effort, you know. And, and, uh, and now we have to, as, <clears throat> as Bishop Sheen says at the end of the film, in this prophetic expression, we need to look up and we need to rise up to, uh, to God, you know, and return to God, which is the only answer for us. Very good. And uh, the, the other thing you I think that scene alone and that information and that um, scenario, the, the seminarians, the 1,100-plus seminarians, is the, so much of that. And one of the things the, that we highlight well, in the, I'm sorry. Oh, no, one of the, one, it represents that wolf in sheep's clothing. They did not recognize what, how they were being manipulated. Yes. Yes, yes. That that wolf theme uh, obviously comes from the Gospel of Matthew, but uh, also from Hildegard of Bingen, who uh, was, a, was made a doctor of the Church uh, literally uh, weeks before uh, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, uh, you know, resigned. And uh, he he made her a, a doctor of the church, uh, particularly because her spirituality, which she uh, shares in pro- in the form of prophecy, uh, describes an era of the gray wolf, which is as really the period we're going through now, and that uh, was basically a a, a, rec- a help to recognize movements of false prophecy that uh, certainly uh, socialism fills the bill of that. And uh, so uh, we're drawing on uh, her prophecies made in the 12th century that uh, uh, that have uh, uh, are shaping the way in which in this series we move from institution to institution looking at uh, uh, looking deeper than the sheep's clothing into what's in behind these infiltrations. And uh, the, uh, the we're running, connection between running the a little bit I'm low sorry. on time here, and I wanted to get yes. in two yes. questions before we go. First yes. of all, uh, if somebody wants to get a copy of either one of these uh, films, maybe to show to the, you know the Knights group or just to have yes. at home, uh, how would they get sure. a hold of a copy? Yes. We we have a wonderful HD high definition uh, and full stereo edition uh, uh, that is obtainable from genderagendamovie dot com. Genderagendamovie dot com. Okay. It's a streaming edition that people can download, but it's in full high definition. Beautiful. It's uh, right from the original master and. And uh, so you'll have it in the best Wait. color and quality, uh, and that's yeah. offered right now. So that's available immediately. And on the 23rd of October, uh, which I guess is tomorrow, uh, they'll, EWTN will be releasing the DVD. Uh, people can order it from EWTN Religious Catalog at EWTNRC.com. Good. 
Now, the, the final question I have for you is what, what's new? What's up? You got anything on the drawing boards that we ought to know about? Well, we're, uh, there's a bunch of projects that have been in development for a while. Uh, we have a, a film on Our Lady that we would like to produce. I mean, uh, it's very important to reveal these wolves in sheep's clothing, but we, the people sure need to, you know, they need the answer to these these spiritual uh, problems, and Our Lady is well, let really us, the antidote. Let us know when you get that ready, because we'll have you sure. back on again. Uh, and there's other films, me telling too. You we're out of time, so I've got to let yes. you go right now. But thank you so much for being with us. God bless you for what you do. They're wonderful documentaries, so much, and people thank ought to you, watch Mike, them. If they're going to be on this Sunday, please tune in. Uh, no, thank we love you your again. work. Thank you. Uh, Stephen mm -hmm. and Richard Payne from Arcadia Films. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, and we will be right back after these final messages. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by the Catholic Tuition Organization. Your support of CTO provides qualifying families tuition assistance to send their kiddos to our Catholic schools. They benefit and you benefit with 65% Iowa tax credits. Online at ctoiowa.org. Until December 15th, contributions from new donors are matched. New donors double their impact with a donation to CTO. Thanks to the Reichardt Family Foundation. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Dowling Catholic Sports is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic. With two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling graduate, and Dr. Craig Harper, the Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at 60th and Ashworth in West Des Moines. 515-440-4610 or online, ashworthvision.com. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, Dr. Christine Mulcahy, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Faith on Trial provided by Paul Martin and Paul Mitchell, owners of Imogene Ingredients. Imogene Ingredients supply specialized feed ingredients for livestock and pet diets to improve maternal and young animal health in both conventional and organic production. Information about Pharmatan and other products at ImogeneIngredients.com. Paul and Paul are members of St. Augustine's Knights of Columbus and encourage their brother knights to keep standing for their faith. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Storm Alert Weather is provided by Divine Treasures. Divine Treasures is a Catholic book and gift store serving the Des Moines community for over 25 years. Their mission is to help Catholics know, love, and keep their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and His Church. Divine Treasures is where you can find great Catholic books, beautiful Bibles, rosaries, jewelry, statues, and religious gifts for those memorable events in your life. Divine Treasures, 5701 Hickman Road, Des Moines, 515-255-5230. Thank you to Divine Treasures for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Thank you, Skeffington's Formal Wear, for sponsoring Dowling Catholic High School football. In business since 1951, Skeffington's Formal Wear offers quality service, style, and selection, providing tuxedos, suits, and casual groom attire for weddings, proms, and any other special occasion. Skeffington's Formal Wear, with convenient locations in Des Moines, West Des Moines, Davenport, Coralville, and Ankeny. All locations are family-owned and operated by members in their respective communities, fitting you for life celebrations, online at skeffingtons.com. And we're back. This is Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. Gina, we're almost out of time here, but I think we had a very productive and interesting uh, program today. So much to talk about. Uh, Brenna is so um, smart about all things court oriented. You know, she ran for attorney general of the state of Iowa at one point, and she's very smart. I, one of the things I want to real quick mention under that umbrella is that our ballots have a question on them asking us if we want to have a constitutional question. And I want to remind our listeners that by answering yes, and a majority people answer us, yes, we'll have a convention that could be open to all kinds of changes to our Iowa state constitution. Yeah, so that, be careful. No is a safe one. vote for them. I would definitely. All right, say let's. Uh, 
we have to uh, wrap it up here, so let's uh, finish with our prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. That's it for today. Thank you for listening, and join us next week for another edition of Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. Until then, have a blessed and peaceful week. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Faith on Trial, Thursdays at 10 a.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio, iowacatholicradio.com, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imaging Ingredients.